Oh, all right. You know, I say this all the time, but it kind of blows my mind sometimes when I watch God work in ways that maybe you guys don't see. I've said it before, but we don't orchestrate the message with the music and with the things that are happening. Peggy has no idea what I'm about to talk about. And, and it just blows my mind how God works things out. Earlier this morning, I asked Jessica if she wanted to preach, um, and she very vehemently denied that, said no. Uh, but Sandy's not here today, so Jessica did our morning Get Your Worship On message, and it played directly into what we're going to talk about this morning. We are in week four, which is the final week of this Life Church series, In God We Trust. And this morning, I want to talk about grace and truth. If you have any ideas, we're in John 1. It's going to be the, the base for the message this morning, the first part of John's gospel. John, the apostle who wrote a letter to the church documenting everything that he saw and witnessed and experienced with Jesus. And John starts his letter to the church in John 1.1, 1, 1, and he says this, In the beginning was the Word, and he's referring to Jesus here. The Word is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him, Jesus, was life, and that life was the light to men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And I want to pause on that this morning because I didn't plan on saying this, but when I read it this morning, it hit me like a sack of potatoes when I read that. I just want to point out the fact that John points out that the darkness has not overcome. John says that Jesus is the light to mankind. And Jesus' light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness did not overcome it. The darkness will not overcome it. It will never overcome it. The evil in this world has never and will never overcome Jesus. Then we jump to verse 14. John goes on to say that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. And we're going to lean hard into those last five words this morning. Full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. And if Jesus is full of grace and truth, then we Christians, we Jesus' followers, we believers in Christ should also be full of grace and truth. The trouble is, we Christians get it wrong. And we get it wrong all the time. And that's not a criticism. It's not a judgment. It's just a statement of fact. We get it wrong sometimes. As Jesus' followers, as disciples and believers in Jesus, we have received from God mercy. We have received from God grace, forgiveness of our sins because of that belief in Jesus. We have received grace and forgiveness and truth, and as such, we should extend that same grace, forgiveness, and truth to those that we come in contact with. But far too often, we fail to do so. You could title this message, When Christians Get It Wrong, because we get it wrong. We get it wrong often. I get it wrong. We fail. Maybe one of my prayers today for us is that we would allow the Spirit of God to convict us and inspire us to change, that we might eventually get it right, that we could potentially be a better reflection of Jesus' grace and truth. You know, for years, our country has been referred to as a Christian country, right? We are predominantly a Christian country. If you look at our currency, all over our currency is stamped the phrase, in God we trust. 
We can talk about our pledge. When we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, it is one nation under God. Even in our pledge to the flag, there is the, the purview that we are a nation and we are alleging ourselves to that nation, but it is under the authority of God. Our country was founded on Christian principles. And when you speak to people from other countries, you find that they view the United States as a Christian nation. But there's a growing number of Americans who are starting to identify themselves as post-Christian. They are post-Christian Americans. They are not agnostic. This is not a belief that God is everywhere and God is in everything and we all end up in heaven. We just take different routes to get there. This is not an atheistic view that there is no God or uh, there is no Jesus, but post-Christian. Post-Christian meaning we've had some experiences with Christianity. Maybe they grew up in the church and they were in the church when they were young, but then they left the church. Or, or maybe they were their Christmas and Easter, the C and E Christians, right? We go on the major holidays. And that's about it. Or maybe they were baptized at one point when they were a child and they, they went to church. They've experienced Christianity, but they have since rejected it. It's not that they don't know about Christianity, but they just don't care. And in fact, according to a Barna Group study, five of the top 100 post-Christian cities in America are right here in Michigan. It seems as though perhaps faith in Jesus has moved from the center off to the fringe and being a Jesus follower has shifted. It used to be that it was a positive thing. Being a follower of Jesus meant something. It was positive, but now it almost seems as though being a follower of Jesus is almost something of a threat to certain people. The phrase Christian has become a loaded term and it no longer means what it used to mean years ago. And if you're an evangelical Christian, it's even worse. Evangelical Christians are now viewed as hateful and bigoted and judgmental and hypocritical. So how do we faithfully represent Jesus in a post-Christian Culture, right? How do we, as followers of Jesus, how do we represent Jesus? How do we bring glory and honor to God? And how do we dignify people in a culture that is seemingly becoming more and more opposed to Jesus? You'd probably agree that it seems like we're living in a very divided Everything, whether it's politics or religion or, or race, it just seems like everywhere we're being more and more divided in this country. But a divided world needs a united church. A divided world absolutely needs the church to be united because if we can't be united as a church, how do we expect anyone else? It's true that no matter who holds office, no matter what the climate of the country is, no matter who the congressmen and women are, no matter who our governor is, our mission as the church does not change. Jesus gave us our mission before he departed into heaven and told us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that I have taught you, and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is our mission as the church, and that does not change. But if I could pull a little bit out of John 1.14, I would say that the way we carry out that mission is to live and love with grace and truth just as Jesus did. John 1.14 again says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, 
glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was absolutely full of grace and truth. Now, I'm sure many of you know someone who's full of something. And I don't want to know what you think they're full of. My grandfather used to tell me there was a reason my eyes are brown. <laughs> but Jesus was full of grace and truth. Okay, and the Greek word that John uses here for full is this word play race. Okay, that means to fill to the brim, abounding in, thoroughly full. The imagery that I get is that glass of water. We've all done this experiment or seen this experiment, maybe on a penny or a glass of water, but you fill the glass completely full, and you can start adding little bits of water at a time. And eventually, the water in the glass seemingly like mounds up over the glass, and it looks like it's about to spill over the edge of the glass. And you wonder, how can that water not spill out? And scientifically, it's the surface tension of the water. But it's so full that if you merely touch it, the water spills out of it, right? Jesus is that full of grace and of truth that merely bumping into Jesus, grace and truth will spill out of him and we as the church we as Jesus followers should be so full of grace and truth that simply bumping into us the grace and the truth spill out of us and why does it matter why is that so important for us as the church because grace and truth are the two most important things in Christianity because it is grace that saves and truth that sets us free. Grace saves us and truth sets us free. And if Jesus, full of grace and truth, came to earth and extends to us grace and truth, then we should live full of grace and truth as well. But if we're honest, we don't do a very good job of that. If we're honest, we fail. Right? And I've talked to people. I've talked to plenty of people, church people and non-church people, and they tell me all the time, I don't like Christians. And if I'm honest, some of them I've told, you know what, neither do I. There's some Christians that I don't like. Some Christians drive me crazy because one of the biggest challenges that we as Christians face is living fully in grace and truth. It is difficult to live fully with grace and truth. Most of us tend to lean towards grace or truth, right? We lean hard one direction or the other, but we have a hard time living in the middle full of grace and truth. And as a result, we tend to disagree with and we, we argue with and we don't get along with and we don't like people that are on the other side because I'm heavy on grace and he's heavy on truth or vice versa, and it creates a conflict. You see, truth, truth says, the Bible says, right? Truth says, thou shall not. Truth says you're a sinner and you need to repent, and if you don't repent from your sin, you're going to die and burn in hell and spend eternity apart from God in hell. And we all know people that are truth they lean more towards truth. And then there's grace. Right? Grace says, you know what, it's okay. Grace says, you're okay. Grace says, we're all sinners and nobody's perfect. Right? Grace says, don't judge me for the decisions I make because I'll be forgiven. God will forgive me. When we do this and when we lean heavy towards one side or the other of that spectrum, it creates two major problems. And the first problem is this truth without grace leads to rebellion. Right? When it's truth, 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 and it's nothing but truth, and God said this, and the Bible says this, 
And when we lean heavy on truth with no empathy and no understanding, without love and without grace, it leads to rebellion. People rebel hard against that. And we've seen it. We all know people who had parents, and their parents were very strict, very legalistic, by the book. This is the way it's going to be. And what happened to their kids? They rebelled, and they rebelled hard against that. Truth, without grace, will lead to rebellion. The second problem is that grace, without truth, leads to relativism. Right? When, there's, when there's no such thing as absolute truth, there's your truth and there's my truth. And, and you know what? Nobody, including God, can tell me what to do. No matter what I do, as long as what I do doesn't affect or negatively affect or hurt somebody else, then, then what I do doesn't matter. Right? Do whatever you do. Do what makes you feel happy. Grace without truth leads to that mentality. It leads to relativism. It, it's love and acceptance without any kind of definitive standard. So how should we, the church, respond? Right? How do we respond to this? You know, unfortunately, in our culture today, what's become really common in the church is this idea of get a little bit of Jesus. Right? We want just a little bit of Jesus. Get a little Jesus. Small doses of Jesus, because small doses of Jesus make me feel better about myself. Right? Whether it's a clip of, of one of my favorite pastors on social media, or, you know what, i got to get on my Bible app and read the verse of the day. I'm not going to study the Bible, but i got to read a verse today so that I keep my streak up and say that I've been in the Bible for six weeks. You know, sometimes it's coming to church when it's convenient. But we want to get just a little bit of Jesus. We try to get just enough Jesus in our life to make us feel better about ourselves, but not enough Jesus to make us feel better. But Jesus came full of grace and truth. I believe that we have been called to live and to love full of grace and and truth, the grace that saves and the truth that sets us free. Now, unfortunately, what I think has gotten the church in more trouble recently than not is a lack of grace. So many Christians are good at doing the truth part. We're good at picking up the Bible and pointing to the Bible. And we know scripture. And you shouldn't do this because it's here. And God said to do this because it's here. And we do really good at truth. Sometimes we fail when it comes to grace. So what is grace? Right? What exactly is grace? Now the Greek word that John uses here is called charis. It's undeserved kindness, favor, and goodwill of God. The loving kindness of God. You know, here's the thing about grace. Grace is completely undeserved. It is 100% absolutely undeserved. You did nothing for it, and you still got it. It's like the kid in the group project that contributed zero to the group project, but because the group got an A, the kid got an A, when really he did nothing. It's completely undeserved. And the moment that you think that you deserve it, it's no longer grace. We know that grace saves. Right? The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus and told them in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. It's not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. Grace saves us. I think the church needs to focus more on grace. Jesus came full of grace and truth in John 1.14. And I find this interesting. Okay, and I don't believe in coincidence. I believe that God knew exactly what he was doing when he inspired these men to write these exact words. And here's the interesting thing to me about this particular passage. Grace comes 
first. Jesus came full of grace and truth. It was grace that came first. We must lead with grace. Our first thought should always be one of grace. Let me give you a little mind exercise real quick. We got some time because things went kind of fast. Imagine for me, for a minute, you're sitting in the pew. And you look down the aisle to your left and your right, and you see a few people in the pew with you. And maybe one of them's a mom. And she's a single mother for whatever reason. She's a single mom. And she's got a couple kids, and, and she works hard. She takes care of her kids because she has two jobs that she works almost full time, and she picks up extra jobs on the side to get money. And she struggles, and she feels overworked and overwhelmed and exhausted. And she has a friend. Her friend's a stay-at-home mom. Right? Her, her friend's husband makes a lot of money, so she stays at home with the kids. And she has an easy, relaxing life, and they're friends. But the truth is, she's jealous of her friend. She's jealous of the life that her friend has. And in fact, she has some envy. And she talks good to her friend, but often gossips behind her back. And maybe... Next to her is a man, and this man is a businessman. And he started his own business, built it from the ground up. It is a very successful business, but he's done so at the cost of personal relationships and questionable business tactics and shady business deals. This man is greedy. He's selfish, and he's a lover of money. Maybe next to him is a college kid, a frat boy. Right? And he's in college because that's what everybody else is doing. And he really not, doesn't care so much about the college education. He's just there because that was the next thing that he was supposed to do. And while he's there, he joins a fraternity and he's partying. He's enjoying himself. If there's booze, he's there. And the only reason he's really in church is because it just so happens to be Mother's Day. And Mom really wanted me to come, so keep Mom happy I can. Otherwise, he's at church and partying and drinking and sleeping with whoever he wants to do, doing whatever it is that makes him feel good. And maybe next to that kid is a hyper-religious guy, right? A Christian. He doesn't do what everyone else does. He doesn't drink and party, right? He's not into premarital sex. He's, he's not a lover of money. He's not selfish and greedy. But he looks down his nose at all. And he judges them with contempt. Out of these four people, who needs grace? They all do. Every one of them needs grace. Maybe you need grace. Maybe you need grace from other people. Maybe you need to give yourself some grace. You know, sometimes the church gets this completely and I've been there, and I've been a part of that church. That church that says, this is what we believe. And as long as you believe what we believe, and you behave, then you can belong. And if you believe like we do, and you behave the way you should, and you belong, everything's good. But the moment you start misbehaving, we're going to gossip about you and call it prayer. Or if you don't behave and you start to believe something different, we're going to ask you to leave the church. You can belong as long as you behave and you believe. And I've been in that church. But the problem with that is that's not the gospel. It's not even close to the gospel. Jesus didn't say to anybody, change your life, start behaving the way that you need to behave, and then you can follow me. Jesus always said, follow me, and then I will change your life. The church must lead with grace. The church must be a place where people can belong before they believe. 
a place where people can belong before they behave. I know what you're thinking because I, I thought it too. I mean, that sounds dangerous, right? It sounds like we're going to just let anybody come in here and be a part of us, and they're going to do whatever they want to do, and we'll become a place without standards. But Paul actually addressed this. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church in Rome, and in Romans 5, Paul was talking about God's grace and the grace that we get from God, and he talks about how we, we receive this grace even though we sin and even though we continue to sin, God continues to give us grace, and the more the sin increases, the greater the grace from God increases. And then in Romans 6, 1, Paul writes this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Right? That, that's grace. But then Paul follows that with truth. And he says in verse 2, by no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? We must lead with grace and proclaim the truth. The trouble is too many post-Christians and, and people in this generation are skeptical about truth, right? And if you claim to know the truth, then you're arrogant at best or you're dangerous at worst. But the fact is, truth isn't restricted. Truth isn't repressive. Truth isn't oppressive. Truth is actually free. Truth is liberating. Truth is life giving. I mean, look at the Garden of Eden. Right? God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and said, you can have access to all of my creation. Everything. Just don't eat from that tree. If you eat from that tree, bad things are going to happen. If you eat from that tree, you're going to lose your innocence and you'll die a spiritual death. The truth was don't eat from that tree. And that truth wasn't given to them to limit their fun, but to give them freedom to protect them from danger. And it gives them freedom. This is the only rule you have to follow. Everything else, go have fun and enjoy creation. God's rules were loving and liberating and life-changing. And the fact is, truth, truth isn't just rules. And truth isn't just morals. Truth is a person. Truth is Christ. Jesus said, and we studied this in John 8, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the truth sets us free. Grace saves, and truth frees. And look at every part of Jesus' ministry. Look at every person that Jesus interacted with. He met them with grace, and then proclaim to them the truth. Whether it was Zacchaeus, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, Jesus always said, I forgive you, but go and sin no more. Grace saves, and truth frees. So who is Jesus? Jesus is the word made free dwelt among us. He was full of grace and truth. And you know the truth is, the post-Christian mentality, they're not rejecting Jesus. They're just rejecting the watered-down version of him that the church possesses. Jesus is grace and truth. And as his followers, we must be full of grace and this church must be full of grace and truth. And if we fully trust and follow Jesus' example, to the best of our ability, lead with grace and proclaim the truth. And then just trust God. And let God do the rest. Let's pray together. God, I just thank you so much. 
for that truth. And it's hard, God. It's really hard to live fully in grace and truth. Oftentimes, God, we want to just beat on one end or one side of the drum, whether it's grace or truth. And God, we understand that there's problems with that. We understand, Jesus, that you came full of grace and truth. And we ask you today, God, that you would help us to change. Convict us in the areas of our life that we need to change, that we need to try better, try harder to get it right, to be people that you've called us to be, to be full to the brim, to be abundantly full of grace and truth. And God, as we do that, as we are people in a church who leads with grace and proclaims the truth, knowing that your grace frees, your grace saves us, God, it saves us from our sin, and your truth that sets us free. As we do that, we trust in you to do the rest. God, help us to be a people who are full of grace and truth. In Jesus' name.